Thank you very much, Dr. Spencer. And, and Dr. Soon. All right. I always keep my phone up front because uh, I'm still waiting for Al Gore to ring me <clears throat> in case of some emergency situation. My slide, please. By the way, my name is Willie Soon, and uh, I'm extremely lucky in the sense that uh, my presentation is based on contribution of this chapter in this book, chapter two. And uh, all the good stuff is done by my good colleagues, Dr. Michael Connolly, and of course, Dr. Ronan Connolly, who's watching from, uh, from uh, London, London, Ontario. In any case, let me move to the next slide. Yeah, indeed, there are 13 chapters in this, in this uh, thing. So please read this particular chapter. And then in case I run too fast, in case you cannot see the slide at the bottom, since the arrangement is not ideal, please contact me at willie at series, C-E-R-E-S dash sign dot com, so you can get the slide if you want to. Let's start with IPCC, obviously. I do want to let you in on this two key secret, right? The temperature record they use, it just ain't so. It contaminated by urban heat island effect, as Roy has just sort of show you, hint at it. I'll provide more details. The second part is, of course, is basically my whole career was based on studying the sun. And the estimate of the solar activity by the UN IPCC report, and by direct implication, the US EPA CO2 endangerment findings, it's all corrupted. It's all really cherry picking to the, in, in the worst possible way. And I'll show you, of course, the details. UN IPCC, what it is? It started in uh, 1988, obviously, and then it has a very specific mandate. So we can't blame IPCC for saying a lot of this sort of thing, politicizing things, you know? They're saying that they want to provide government with all levels with scientific information they can use to develop climate policy. It's fine, seems to be very, very reasonable, but the problem is they don't tell you what happened if you have scientific evidence that goes against this carbon dioxide driving everything, right? Basically the CO2 control knob in the earth climate system that you can adjust up and down. I mean, the idea is that if it's globe too warm, you reduce CO2, then it get cool. If it's too, like maybe it's too cold, we increase the CO2, right? In case you want to melt all the uh, ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet, you know, I'm going to say you just add more CO2, you melt all the ice sheets. It's extremely difficult to melt ice sheets with carbon dioxide, believe me. Then IPCC report has been published since 1990. The last one was 2021, AR6, assessment report six. And then for all of you who are interested, they are not going away anytime soon. So the next report will be coming out in 2027 and 2029. And then my job here, of course, the iconic statement from IPCC and so on and so forth, our US global change research, is, uh, is basically saying that the observed global warming since 1950s is mostly all man-made, right? And clearly that this is a very interesting statement that I think that is unsupportable, okay? And we'll show you the evidence how. The first question is that global. What does it mean to have a global temperature? It means clearly that if you look at the, the top chart where you show the distribution of available thermometer station, there ain't no data in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm very sorry. So you cannot just simply use the word global, this, global, that, right? Of course, for the current period, 1971 to 2000, that's adequate data, reasonable, okay? But you can't go 150 years or 130 years to say that you have global temperature. It is not so. So be careful when you see this sort of statement being made. The first thing I want to show you is that, obviously, IPCC framed the problem of proving that carbon dioxide causing global warming using two steps. It's called detection and attribution, yes? The first step is detecting what is climate change, what is global warming. And here, I would be more conservative showing you the northern hemisphere temperature data, okay? You can see a bunch of uh, orange line or red line. These, those are all the different results coming from our NASA, our NOAA, or even the UK climatic, uh, Climate Research Unit, and even the Chinese Meteorological Agency. Those are all the data. They all agree. And to prove that we can do this, science is all about what? Replication, right? We are able to replicate the result exactly. That's a result that we published 2021, led by Ronan Connolly. That tells you that, guess what? We can do exactly what they do. That's very, very important. But the question is that, is this record good enough for you to interpret climate change? 
We say no, it's not, because it's contaminated by urban heat island effects. The first thing we want to show is that how large or how small is the urban heat island effect. IPCC for many, many years, decades in fact, trying to say that urban heat island effect is small. So the latest report, the 2021 report, actually say that it's less than 10%. It couldn't affect the global warming trend by more than 10%. Sounds very conservative, but is it so? It's not. It's so easily proven to be wrong, actually. Let's start with the US, uh, well, let's start with urban heat island effect. What is it? Here is a heat map of uh, Washington, D.C., your favorite city, right? The blue part showing you the cool heat map, the cool part, and then the red part is basically, red or orange part is the urbanized area. Basically, the places where if you look at the actual map, it's basically concrete and asphalt, right? These are the orange part. And the number is quite large. The difference between the cool and the warm part is up to 17 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Sorry, I use Fahrenheit since we're American, right? We refuse to conform. <laughs> in, in any case, if you want to talk about urban heat island effects, let me show you now. On your left is actually the 20 percent most urbanized uh, station in the United States, okay? It shows a warming trend, a particular warming trend. And then on your right is the 20 percent most rural station. And it shows another warming trend. If you combine the two together, you can see that it's up to 80 percent more. The number kind of similar to what Roy has shown for the summer temperature for US that he just published. Actually, it's a very, very good paper, and I recommend everybody to read Roy's paper as well. But these are results that is showing you beyond doubt. It's not 10%. It's very large. So this urban heat island effect really contaminated, and U.S. do have the best temperature record for the world, okay? So now, let me summarize for you. So what do you do next? So my idea, our idea is very simple. Why don't we start by using only rural station? And that's shown at the bottom of the right, right-hand side. Right, bottom panel. The top panel is the same result for the urban and rural station together. But we smooth the data now by 11-year filter so you can see the long-term changes. And the bottom one, you can see that it's a very different character. First of all, the, the, the overall warming trend is 50% less. Okay? It's basically 0.3 divided by 0.6, 50% less than the, the one has the urban station included. Okay. That tells you, and plus, the key thing is actually the character of the changes. It has warming, cooling, warming, cooling, more rather than just strictly warming as implied by rising carbon dioxide, right? So these are stuff that we have published, and to show you how reasonable the rural-only station, we actually compare with, let's say, the sea surface temperature, which will not be contaminated by urban heat island, right? And then even the tree ring proxy, and then from glacial length estimate, these are showing reasonable agreement, that tells you that something is quite interesting to, to talk about this rural-only station, okay? And what's next? What's next will be the attribution process. What does IPCC do? Attribution meaning that, okay, we want to find, if we have a climate change, what are the causal factors, right? So IPCC will talk about basically the anthropogenic factor, namely the rising carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, you know, nitrous uh, oxide, so on and so forth. And then you also have so-called natural forcing, which includes solar and volcano, right? And you can see how well IPCC present the, the case for the man-made factors, the 11, year, 11 smoking guns. Essentially, they included bean counting, they count everything, including contrails and stuff that you don't even know what exists, actually. Whereas for the sun and volcano, you can see, the sun is on your far right. If you guys can see this, it's basically nothing. Magic, really. But in some sense, I want to prove to you that this is how weak the science is. They think that they can keep doing things like this. Unfortunately, it just ain't so. Okay? So my, my, our question is, that could they have underestimated the role of science? Sure, yeah, it is. In fact, this is what IPCC is doing. We show you that there are at least 27 different pieces of, of estimate of the sun. We call it TSI, total solar irradiance. Basically, all the light output from the sun. Okay? And these are all 27 of them. I plot them all. Not intent for you to read it. But we classify these 27 different estimates in terms of eight, what we call the ACRIM estimate, which are actually large solar variability. I'll group them together. And then there are additional stuff that basically saying that the sun doesn't change much. 
doesn't change much. It's a, it's a model estimate, it's an assumption. And IPCC forgot to tell a lot of people about this. I want to start with IPCC, the fifth assessment, which was published in 2013. In the 2013 report, they recommended four estimates. And you can imagine 20, 2021, six, what do they call? Only one, they're down to one now. And between 2013 and 2021, what happened in solar physics? Nothing. They have no reason to reject the other model. They just simply say that we like it so, so now it's over. Now we have only one left. This is the problem. And then these are the eight one that eight, what we call acrim, which is large irradiant changes model. Okay? And we think that these are relevant to study. So I wonder if you can look at this graph. Can you really, really believe that what IPCC say is correct? That is only one of them? He ain't so. We have actually published all these papers, and I want to tell you how we deal with all this. Well, this is the first paper that officially we published with 37 co-authors 18, from 18 countries and almost 200 references. The reason I put out this chart is that I want to tell you that it is well read, a lot of people read them, but the most important audience here is actually the IPCC co-chair himself, Dr. Pan Mao Jai of Working Group One. He knew about our work. He actually cited our work positively, talking about we are correct on this problem of an urban heat island in temperature record, talking about what we recognize about how solar irradiance, solar estimates should be far more than the restrictive, you know, just basically cherry picking by IPCC six assessment. So he knew about all this. Uh, and then follow up the next month, Ronan finished up all the problem, meaning that we cover all the studies. So we look at five temperature estimate using the urban plus rural, rural only, and then of course the tree rings and sea surface temperature, so on and so forth, and see how well we can actually explain them using the causal factors. We clear, just to show you one example, the IPCC estimate, the red line here, the carbon dioxide rising, can only explain the part from 1970 onward. It just couldn't explain anything else, right? But then if you use a solar irradiance, you can see that many models and actually can explain the, the, the changes. That just tell you that if you say that nat natural climate change can be ruled out, it's completely not true. So that's not what it is, right? So this is what I, I mean by that. Another thing that I want to take another minute to explain this graph, because this graph has been circulated everywhere. It's very popular and it has a brand of NASA artists. But remember, this is not your, this is not the NASA that actually sent a man to the moon and bring them back. This is the kind of uh, cheating what you call graphical cheating. This is, uh, by the way, this graph, you can see what's the problem. I hope you're educated enough now, right? The red curve is basically urban heat island contaminated temperature curve. The yellow curve, the solar irradiance, is that cherry pick one by IPCC. It served serve no purpose except for political games. So I'm very sorry that this is actually wrong. So you all have to be aware of that. Since I'm facing a group of uh, policy makers, I want to say that indeed, funding is the basic problem in climate science today, is utterly corrupted, okay? No wonder 97% of those scientists will agree whoever is funding them, right? And we need to fix this problem, okay, if I may say so. I want to finish up by tying back to the US EPA CO2 endangerment finding that was issued around December of 2009. It is an embarrassment to United States, put it this way, okay? It is a, 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 a finding that actually say that they were based on IPCC AR4, which was published in 2007. And then it's also talking about the National Research Council report and also the 2009 US GCRP, which is the US Global Change Research Report. But we know by now the IPP, IPCC selection is, is pseudo-scientific, right? Because it, it, of course, cherry pick, it has a temperature record that is uh, contaminated by urban heat island. And then it has that, that solar, the cherry picking of the solar. And here's the problem of the, the 2009 US GCRP report on your right hand side. The left is actually original AR4 report. I wonder how many of you have seen this? This is the same problem that we're talking about, but somebody, somebody really mistakenly converted the temperature unit from temperature anomalies to absolute temperature. They thought that you could easily do that. This is how uneducated US EPA is actually, the people that are working there. That's enough. The whole idea is then, it's been 15 years later, we really ought to revisit this CO2 endangerment. 
because the result just simply should not stand, okay? I hope EPA is not bold enough to try to regulate the sun if, if natural climate change prevails, right? Thank you.